Okay, good afternoon, everyone. That's uh, today is uh, what day is today? Uh, October 15th, 2022. And we are going to talk about the Asian philosophy. And then uh, today's subject is about the Confucianism in Tang Dynasty, which I will focus around the uh, uh, the middle of the uh, eighth century between 750 to 850 during these hundred years. I think that's the key development uh, in the Confucianism. If you have been, let me go through our uh, schedule. Okay, so <clears throat> I have been, sorry, I've been skipped a few uh, weeks because uh, October is quite busy uh, week. Uh, a busy months. So, okay, so I should go back to my weekly uh, meetup. So today we will go, if you were here before and you probably know, we haven't talked about Confucianism for, for a long time. And then not because I don't want to talk about this. The reason is uh, the history uh, between the third century up to now, Confucianism has not has been practiced, but not been a focus um, in China. So right now, today we were going back to Confucianism. Okay, so uh, that's in the same. Uh, let's fix the time on the seven fifty uh, 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 CE. Okay, so that's this week. And if you read the book, the assignment reading, you will find out the next week. Uh, the, the, the chapter is talking about the uh, cosmologist. In, and the most cosmo, uh, cos, uh, cosmologists are in Song Dynasty, which is 300 years later. And the, the author, Feng Youlan, only put about three, four pages into uh, Tang Dynasty. So I don't see that's a good treatment. So I want to make this week as a... Uh, 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 special, uh, uh, a special uh, uh, a section, uh, give more information about the Tang Dynasty. So if you look at, go through the schedule, if I follow the schedule next week, we will talk about the uh, Song Dynasty, uh, the important, uh, hold on, the Song Dynasty, uh, talk about cosmologist. And then when we call cosmologist, basics in another sense is metaphysician, okay? So, but Chinese metaphysics is different than Western sense of uh, metaphysician, okay? Because the Chinese uh, talk about the existence of God, the immortality of soul or the uh, human, uh, the, the free mind, uh, freedom, okay, free will. But, you know, that's called the co uh, cosmology. And uh, later on, you will see uh, uh, so-called the two school and the principal school and the my heart school. They will be kind of similar to in uh, European philosophy. We talk about continental, uh, Kantian and the human, this kind of separate. Then we go all the way around. So about uh, 300 years down the road, the uh, Zhu Xi will be have the Neo-Confucianism, which is important. Uh, the, so the development of the Neo-Confucianism is a long route, take about like three, 400 years to get mature. So that's the, uh, the case we are going to do. So let me move on. So let's go through the history. Okay, so if you look at the history, I have showed this chart for a long, uh, for many times. And then, uh, that's what I mean. Okay, so in this one, we most we spend time on the so-called the six famous school, legalism, uh, Taoism, Confucianism, the school of names, all this one in the early time. And then we go through the history, right? So during the Han Dynasty, uh, we talk about Confucianism. That's important, the Dong Zhong Su, okay, if you remember, uh, Dong Zhong Su, that's the Confucianism, but the Confucianism is different than the Confucianism Confucius taught. It's put a lot of effort on the heaven and the human interaction. And that during the first century, uh, 
uh, during this, uh, about the first century or zero century, the beginning of century, uh, they have the Confucianism revolution, but it only take about 14 years and it failed. Then after that, the development is more on the religious side. So the, uh, uh, the heaven part has gone into the Taoism, so become the near Taoism. And in the Jin dynasty, they have the, uh, the China spread to south and the north. In the southern part is more on the near Taoism. And the northern part will focus because during that time, the uh, Buddhism start to uh, uh, transmit, uh, transfer to China. So they become heavy Buddhism uh, thinking. So we have been spent a few weeks talk about uh, Buddhism. Uh, about the Xuanzang, about the uh, Kumarajima. Okay, so this uh, famous Buddhism, they translate the uh, Buddhism religion to China. And uh, during this period of time, uh, it, if you look at the Chinese development, the basics, uh, the government is still, uh, we can call it the Confucian government, but in the liter literature, philosophy, most people, they are in the thinking of uh, Taoist religion and also in the Buddhism religion. So during that time is a more religious uh, feeling okay, during the time. So today we are going to talk about the four subject. We are going to talk about this. Basically, we, right now, if you set your time frame, we are in the Tang Dynasty, which is uh, around 600 to 900 during this time. And there are the four subjects I would like to cover today. So first one, I will spend each one, I plan to spend about half hour to cover. So um, the first part would be the uh, <coughs> history of the Tang Dynasty. Okay. And then we talk about a person, his name is Han Yu. I would like to focus more on this person. He's very important in uh, Chinese uh, philosophy, literature, history, political, and uh, that uh, I think people have a different opinion. Some people will like him, some people don't think he did good, but I try to my best to introduce uh, what's his work. And then uh, the third part, I will focus on basics. That's the uh, reading for today. <coughs> we talk about the near Confucianism. Okay. Then I will bring up the extra people, Liao. Liao is a person also introduced by the author, Feng Yulan, but he kind of ignored another important person. His name is Liu Zhongyuan. Okay. He is, uh, in my opinion, he probably uh, more important, um, well, I should not say more important, but Liu Zhongyuan, I like, personally, I like his writing, his philosophy, so I would like to bring this one to kind of like counter what uh, Han Yu uh, is talking about. So before I started uh, for first part, we will talk about the uh, uh, history of Tang Dynasty. Is any question common or any uh, thing uh, you want to talk about or any question before I start? You can raise your hand or... Everything fine? Okay. So let's move on on the first part of the history of the Tang Dynasty. So uh, I should not assume everybody familiar with Chinese history, but you know, and then Tang Dynasty is very rich. There's a lot, a lot of things we can talk about. So uh, I just have to pick up things I think is important. I cannot cover everything. But you know, uh, let's try and you know, I'll give uh, some background about the Tang Dynasty. So Tang Dynasty, before Tang Dynasty, okay, Chinese has about, uh, I would say about 300 years uh, disunion. Okay, basically look at this map. Okay, this map, the map put is on 376 CE. Basically China is not one China. It technically is two parts in the southern part and the northern part. And then we don't have to go to the detail, but you can see on the south part, they go through the Eastern Jin and they go to the Song, Qi, Liang, Chen. 
So they kind of five dynasty one after the other, and then each one only take about 50 years. So if you can imagine, if you live in the southern part of China during that time, you probably face every 50 years. So your lifetime probably have two dynasties, okay? Always have some coup or some uh, revolution happen, okay? That's the south part. And the northern part face a different situation because they have the uh, five tribe. When we say tribe, uh, Chinese call barbarian, just like a Greek like to call non-Greek uh, barbarian, uh, five nomadic tribes, okay, set up, you know, different kingdom during that time. So North and the South are a little bit different. And uh, we introduced during this time in the Southern part, the Chinese developed the so-called neo Taoism, and the gradually also have the religion, the Taoism religion started to develop during this time. So after that, you know, we will start to uh, have the unification of China. So after 300, 400 years, then they have the Sui and the Tang dynasty. So they start to unite, united the China. So Sui dynasty is very short living dynasty only lasts for, I think so, 39 years. And then come with the Tang dynasty. And the Sui and the Tang dynasty are a little bit different because they are not so-called the pure Chinese race, basically since they are in the North. So they carry the Chinese last name, but they all intermarried with the family of the nomadic tribe and the uh, Turk, uh, Turk uh, origin. So they are not culturally, blood-wise, are not pure Chinese in this sense. And then, but their development, uh, Chinese usually will refer this period, uh, Tang Dynasty and the Song Dynasty as the golden age, because culturally it's very well developed. And the more important is, uh, if you look at the China from the East, the Chinese culture, okay, I say culture, not only including writing, writing, technology, medicine, uh, food, okay, architecture, painting, uh, calligraphy, anything start to export, start to influence uh, from to the east side, which is Korea and the Japan. And uh, the Silk Road connect to the west side, uh, to Indian, to Roman, uh, to the uh, Europe, start to connect it for the trade. So during that time, uh, there's, there's a lot of development. So uh, all the Chinese or people in the Chinese culture like to talk about uh, this period of time. And uh, then it's very difficult for me to introduce the culture in the Tang Dynasty. I just have this all the world, poetry, calligraphy, landscape painting, philosophy, political thought, historical writing, scientific advancement, like astrology, chemistry, medicine, and production of fine silk, porcelain, tea, and blah, 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 everything, you know, during this period of time. Important concept I like to make here is so-called a uh, Han Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty. Okay, so Han Dynasty. So people in China or not in the Asia, people like to call this Han as a race. Okay, so Han more represent the race of uh, Chinese or the nation nationism of Chinese, and the Tang is more represent the cultural Chinese. So in most of the major city, major country, you all find the Chinatown, okay? But in Chinese, people don't call it the Chinatown. People call it the Tang People Street, okay? So technically, Tang represents the culture, the food, the living style, okay? And Han more represents your race and the nationality. So that's, uh, I have to say about uh, the unification of, uh, uh, China after three, four hundred years of this union. Okay. So if you look at this world, okay, during this time, if you take the global look, the bird's eye view of this world, you will see uh, in this world, actually, Europe is really not that important. Okay, so basics, you know, it's 
Roman Empire. And you look at this one. Uh, and then the major player in this world, you will see the Tang Empire here. And then they have the Tibetan Empire, which is established almost the same time as the Tang, uh, Tang Empire. And the Wei uh, 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 Empire okay, on the north. So on the Asia, that's this one. And then uh, Umeya, okay, after, I think uh, if we take 750, it's Umeya the Caliphate. If 751, that become the Abbasid, okay. Uh, but anyway, basically this world is dominated by Tang, Umayyad, Tibet, and uh, Weiwu. Okay. So that's the land um, uh, during this period of time. And I always like to think about this question when we talk about between 600 and 800, and 600 in Europe is uh, great, the Gregory the Great. Uh, after that, and 800 years, that's the Charlemagne, right? And that's the starting of the so-called uh, Carolingian uh, Renaissance, okay? So I think very hard, you know, between these two person from 600 to 800, I cannot think about any Western philosopher, you know, during this period of time, okay? So, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, probably I don't read enough. And if somebody know, you know, Please let me know. Yeah, I, I don't know anybody know any famous people uh, between 600 and 800. But on the other hand, okay, in Chinese, okay, during this period of time, it's a ton of people. Today, I only can introduce three philosophers. But if you want to go more, they have a lot of poets, they have a lot of painter, uh, calligrapher, and many, many, uh, uh, things that happened during this period of time. But unfortunately in Europe, probably we cannot find many people, many famous advancement during this period of time. So that's the part very interesting to me. Yeah. So uh, let me move on. Okay, since I uh, cannot have everything together, I just made this the major event between uh, 600 to 900. So we can roughly put this way, from 618 all the way to, to here, okay? This one is about 100 years. Here's about 100 years. This one, we will call it the, the golden age, okay, of time. So the country, the empire is growing. So you will see a few uh, great empire, for example, Taizong of Tang, and we introduced about Taizong, okay, it's during the Xuanzang, okay, the uh, Buddhist monk, right? And another famous Empress Wu, that's the Chinese only female emperor, empress, okay, female leader, okay. So that's all the golden time. And after that, they have Xuanzong, okay, uh, Tang Xuan, yeah, Tang Xuanzong and uh, his famous uh, lover, Yang Guifei. So during these hundred years, about, I think it's about hundred years, that's really a, a highly developed country and the nation is expanding. But at the 751, okay, uh, Chinese start or Tang Empire start to face some defeat. So first defeat is uh, uh, the new empire, Abbasid uh, Caliphate, they uh, aligned with the Tibetan Empire, fight against the Chinese Tang Dynasty, and the, the general is Gao Xianzi, and he lost okay, the war. And uh, because of this situation, uh, well, uh, according to legend, uh, uh, the history, the Chinese technology, uh, especially paper making, printing, uh, campus, and the gunpowder start to transfer to waste. And that's what uh, Francis Bacon, I think Francis Bacon calls the great invention. Okay, this one. So at the 755, there's another uh, rebellion happened, so-called Anlu San Rebellion. So basics make the great shake the entire empire. Okay, 
So the country becomes so-called a warlord, okay, because you know, after a lot of civil war and you have to specialize, you have to give the general super, super power. So the general become, you know, set up their own little kingdom. So we call it a warlord and the, but the situation stabilized uh, the Tang empire. So during this period of time, okay, that's the philosopher we are going to introduce for today. It's Han Yu, uh, Liao, Liu Zhongyuan, and the Liu Yuxi. Uh, I, I decided to skip this person because I probably don't have the time. And then follow on that is the persecution of Buddhism. Uh, I will briefly introduce this one. And then, so, so probably China will enjoy about, uh, let's put this way, uh, for the, from this year after 50 year to this year, that's about 50 years of uh, uh, disturbance, okay, a lot of war. But after they have China, China, China start to enjoy another 150 years, about 100 to 150 years, stable, but not that strong uh, 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 country. But during this period of time, a lot of philosopher, uh, cultural movement started to develop. That's what I would like to introduce. So the history moved further. There will be uh, the end of Tang Dynasty, so-called the Huang Chao, okay, Huang Chao Rebellion. And then they put the uh, Tang Dynasty to the end. But after that, they have, have the about 100 years um, uh, uh, disunion. So I call it, the usually historian call it five dynasty and the 10 kingdoms period, okay. So we don't have to go detail introducing, only hear this name, you know, in, the, in this land, they have the five dynasty and the 10 kingdoms. And when historian call five and the 10, it means much more than that. They have a lot, a lot of warload. So after hundred years, then China get a stabilized again, that's so-called the Northern Song Dynasty. This one, the Northern Song Dynasty and the Southern Song Dynasty. So this one is another period of time. Uh, it's interesting and I will spend time next week. We will talk about in the Northern Song Dynasty because during this time, a lot of the, the, the culture is highly developed, but the, uh, the power of the state is got weaker because you start to deal with uh, the foreign from the North and from the uh, East. So that's the uh, major event on that. So uh, something we need to a little bit introduce is about the Andusan Rebellion. Okay, Andusan Rebellion happened in the 740 CE. And this one is a famous, uh, well, I should not say famous. I think this one pretty much represent the situation of Andusan. According to historical account, okay, first Andusan is not Chinese. He is, uh, I don't know what's his race, but basically because the Ch uh, Tang Dynasty, uh, the royal family is not pure Chinese already. And uh, they have a habit to hire the foreigner uh, as a general, okay? And, and you can imagine now people from the North, from the West, you know, are more uh, powerful and the more uh, on the military side. So th th they have the tendency to hire uh, to use this kind of general. For example, the person who lost the war to the uh, Abbasid uh, Caliphate is uh, Gao Xianzi, and uh, he's Korean, he's from Korea. And An Lusan, I think he's Turk, okay? So according to historical account, he is a great general. And during the time is uh, the Xuanzong, the emperor is Xuanzong, and with his famous wife, Yang Guifei, Okay, one of the four great beauty in Chinese history. So uh, the famous scene is uh, An Lusan, not only a general, and he also, uh, he's very fat, okay? And you can see the sign, he's very fat. And the, the, I read the historical account, his belly, when he stand up, his belly can reach his knee. So this kind of a person, but he's a good dancer, okay? So it's hard to imagine people in this kind of figure can dance. So this figure, and he kind of, 
you know, the emperor is quite pleased with him because he can please the emperor very well. So he got a lot of power. And 755, he started to lead the rebellion and he wanted to himself become the empire. So the uh, rebellion got pacified in two years, but his adept son, Shi Shimin, okay, and continue rebel. So basically take about uh, almost 10 years, okay, nine, eight years. So basically according to historical account, probably, uh, probably the one third of Chinese population lost during this period of time. So you can imagine uh, the uh, terrible situation during the time. So after the uh, situation got stabilized, the um, China would be different. You know, it's no more central uh, government, centralized government. It become the so-called uh, world world uh, world Okay, so basics you have to give the general uh, enough power, not only the military power, also have the financial power to uh, tax the people. So they become semi-independent. So we are going to talk about uh, the uh, cultural background during this time is uh, uh, this situation. So, so far, any question, comment? Um, anybody want to talk about? I hope it's clear and because there's a lot of things we need to talk about. So, and I hope it's not uh, still, I still make it clear. Hey, Jason, did you already cover Wuzetan in the last lecture? Uh, no, I didn't. And then another meetup, uh, uh, talk about Wuzetan, okay. No, no, only, only on her uh, influence was the current topic was, was Neo-Confucianism and Confucianism because she made a distinct break, right? Was Confucianism and she endorsed Buddhism because it was better for her power. And that's, that's true. Accurate. I didn't cover this one. Great that you mentioned this one. Okay. Uh, I, I think that kind of my, uh, is, who is speaking? Uh, Chris, right? Okay. So, um, yeah. uh, 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 Javier, I have, uh, you, you are next. Okay. I, I didn't ignore you. I just put your hand down. Okay. Uh, so, to... yeah. And Empress Wu, okay, it's an interesting subject. I was thinking about talking about this, but I'm not sure I have enough philosophy to cover, okay, I, uh, so uh, if you are interested, I probably can bring back, uh, uh, oh, I will talk about this just in a minute, okay, <laughs> because he kind, I, one thing I like to talk about her is she is a powerful woman, and uh, just like Chris talked about, he will, she will promote uh, Buddhism, but I don't think she single hand can promote Buddhism, because Buddhism during that time already in the so-called major culture during that time. And she probably can take advantage of Buddhism, right? Uh, for example, a Chinese emperor usually call himself the son of the heaven, but she's a female. And if you call her daughter of heaven, it's, you know, sons, you know, because they already have a daughter of heaven, you know, of heaven because daughter of heaven is kind of a servant, okay? Not so powerful. So he consider him herself, of incarnation of uh, 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 what's the Buddha's name? Maya uh, Treaty. Uh, Maya Treaty. Okay. So he considered herself of incarnation of uh, uh, one uh, Buddhist travel. Okay. So that's one thing happened. Uh, Javier, you have seen to anything you want to talk about? No, I wanted to ask a question there. I'm a little bit curious. Okay. All these people, all, all these people that you mentioned, they, they, they were rulers, but they were not from China. How they came to power? Through force? They invaded? Okay, so put it right. Okay, uh, I should make it clear on that. So I talk about the people they are, as I, I say, I said they have a Chinese last name, but they intermarriage with the foreign tribe. Okay. So if you think about it, your father married a foreigner, your grandfather also married a foreigner, and your great-grandfather also a, a, a foreigner. So in this case, you are not pure blood. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, okay. Jason. Oh. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, Javier, you want to say something or something? You are muted. I, I think you have. Uh, it's Quen. Quen, you are speaking. Yes, I am very. Yes, I am very to... sorry. Okay, hold on. Who is speaking? Uh, Javier. Okay, no, let's go, no. Javier. Let me answer Javier's question first. Okay, so they are foreigner, but they are they they come to the power because they were the general. Okay, guarded the border. So, uh, so they have a coup. Okay, to overthrow the emperor. So they set up the Tang Dynasty. If I have to make it clear, uh, make it simple, that's the way uh, it happened. So they are Chinese, okay, from the father's side, but you know, their culture is a lot of Turkish culture. Okay. When I say Turkish, it's Turk, it's not today's Turkish, it's more on the Asian side, this kind of culture. Uh, Quinn? Yes, I, I just would. I just want to add a piece of historical uh, precision. Uh, during the three centuries of uh, collapse of empire between the fall of the Jing Dynasty in uh, 317 in the north and the reunification in 589 by the Sui Dynasty, mm -hmm. there was there was a group of. Uh, Called the Guanlong aristocracy. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. it's written G Guanlong aristocracy. Yeah. Yes, it's written G U A L L O N G, and the G is pronounced like a K in the Pinyin system. So Guanlong aristocracy, and that Guanlong aristocracy was in the northwest, and they, as uh, Jason said very clearly, the the father side was uh, Chinese. And the modern side, most of the time, were Turkish people from Central Asia. Okay, and uh, Central Asia correspond to what is called nowadays uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Tajikistan, etc. And that group of Pano aristocracy uh, combined the traditional Chinese culture. Uh, the writing, the governmental structure, the ideal of empire, with the uh, military power of the Turkish cavalry. So that group called the Kwanlong aristocracy would be of utmost importance under the Sui and the Tang dynasty. And they kind of uh, develop themselves during almost two centuries, and their triumph was precisely the creation of the Sui dynasty and the Tang dynasty. So those two dynasties were very cosmopolitan in the sense that there's a Chinese root, but there's also an opening to Central Asia. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for making it clear on that. So, okay, so right now let's back to what we were more focused on, uh, just just keep in mind at that time Chinese culture are more open. Okay, basics you many many reasons. Okay, so Chang'an capital is a metropolitan city, just like today's New York. Okay, because there are a lot of foreign go to there. So, uh, but right now we are talking about after the Anlu San rebellion. Okay, Chinese have become a little bit different because after fifty years war. Okay, and a lot of warlords has been set up and then it's stabilized. And then usually that's the time a lot of culture will start to develop, okay? So uh, let me talk about the, uh, some cultural background during that. Let's set up as a century, okay? What's going on, anyone? So first, the mainstream ideology is branded for Taoism, or we should call it the Neo-Taoism or Taoism religion and the Buddhism, okay? Just like Chris uh, talked about, during the time is Buddhism, it's important. And then uh, Buddhism and Taoism had increasingly come to the emphasis on the other wordness, right? And the Confucianism is more, if you read uh, Confucius Analytic, you know Confucius is more focused on this word, not other word. 
Another new developer is the so-called the imperial examination. Okay, so that's the starting from the Tang Dynasty and get mature in the Song Dynasty and then to the end of the 20th century. So Chinese have a 1300 years experience uh, taking examination. So it's a very important cultural influence. So exam is, but they have, they, it's a common knowledge of writing Chinese classic literary style among the state office, officials. Okay, so the subject had been changed from dynasty to dynasty, but, and I just have to say during the Tang dynasty, the test is starting, but probably not that serious compared to uh, Song dynasty or later on in Ming or Qing dynasty. So the common culture helped. So this kind of exam helped unify the empire and the idea of achievement by merit instead of legitimacy to imperial rule. Okay, the examination system played an important role to tempering the power of hereditary aristocracy and the military authority. So in this sense, you know, uh, we have a lot of uh, criticism on the imperial examination. But during this period time, the eighth century, I will have to say, you know, I have to say that probably the world's most advanced system during that time. If you look at around the world, nobody have this kind of uh, system. And then everybody, okay, I, will, I should not say everybody, most of the people, farmer, okay, if you will, okay, you study, if you are smart enough, you pass the exam, you can become the government official, officials. Okay, so that's around the world, probably nobody can have this kind of system. So personally, even I have a lot of criticizing on the, uh, 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 the examination culture, but I have to say during that time, that probably the most advanced. And one thing I like to talk about here is, is also related to the Empress Wu, is the writing style. If you have been uh, with this meetup for long, and I think for last month or two months ago, I started complaining when I translated the ancient Chinese text to English, I faced a lot of difficult because the writing style has been changed in the Confucius time or in the Han dynasty. The writing still, uh, at least for me as a uh, Chinese reader, I can understand easily. And then I, I work hard, I can translate to English. But later and later, the words become more and more difficult. And then uh, I have a hard time to, even I understand, but it's difficult to translate. So these words are sometimes called pian wen. So it become a very rigid during that time, so-called the four, six prose. So I just use this one as an example. I don't know, anybody read this one in Chinese before? Uh, Quan, did you read this one? Yan zuo huang sun zi. No. You, you haven't read no, this my, one? My father showed me some of these, but I was too discouraged to keep on. Yeah, that's, that's okay. So, so you will say, uh, so the, the, the rule, the, the rule basically is a four word or six word. Okay, I four and the six. So when you read it, it sounds very well and very beautiful. And uh, this famous writing, and uh, then I have been, I read it, and it's a beautiful writing. And uh, this one is so-called the prophet during the Empress Wu. They have the uh, Xu Jingye, that's a general. He raised the army, tried to uh, have a crusade against the Empress Wu. Okay, try to restore the Tang Dynasty. Okay. So he usually this kind of crusade, you have to write some uh, proclamation or prophet, right? To declare, okay, I'm righteous and you are sinful. So I have the army to fight against you. So this kind of writing, you have to be very convincing, uh, encouraging. So during that time, you have to write in this way. And I have to admit, that's a beautiful writing, okay? And then, the writing is, I think I will take hours to translate this one because they call the, the, the swallow, the birds, kill the, uh, the son of the emperor, okay, which implied in the Han dynasty, the beauty, 
Zhao Fei Yan, because his her name has Yan means swallow the bird. Okay, kill the thing. So the second word talk about Long Li Di Ho. They talk about in Xia Dynasty, the uh, the beauty was born from the saliva of a uh, dragon. Okay, so all this one, the, you need pack with the historical uh, account to understand, and then they make the words beautiful. So when you familiar this one, when you read it, you find that wow, that's amazing word. But you can imagine in another side, how can I do my philosophy? Use this kind of writing, because there's no way to go through this one. So that's the situation during that time. So uh, Han Yu, or today we are going to talk about is during this time, and the people are going to, especially Han Yu is going to make a movement to change this kind of uh, 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 writing. So, so basics, I will probably uh, uh, introduce the four people here that I'm talking about. So, uh, Han Yu is the most important. They usually uh, um, people call him one of the eight great pros, uh, master of Tang and the Song dynasty. So they have eight people. So Han Yu is one of them, Liu Zhongyue is one of them, and the Ao is not. Okay. So because they are writing, uh, make it easy. So personally, I can, uh, I can, uh, I witness the change. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the okay? You take care. Of? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> so uh uh let's put it this way. When I read to Han Yu, the Ao, and the Liu Zhongyuan, I find out it's easy to read, just okay, much easier than before. So I really uh, benefit from their uh, uh, uh literary movement. Another way to look at Han Yu's work is kind of like a Renaissance in Europe, right? During the time after the crusade, um, people start to discover uh, the Aristotle's work, start to look back on the Greek philosophy because they wake up from the uh, uh, Christian thinking. So same situation, this one is more on the, uh, also on the philosophy side, okay, also on the writing side, they start to look at, okay, the old time during the uh, warring state and early Han dynasty. They want to go back to the freestyle liberation of writing on this one. So um, they are similar, they all Confucianism, but they are a little bit different. So I just made a quick comment. The uh, Han, Fu, uh, uh, Han Yu, basically, he is uh, promoted the writing, all the writing style, they all agree, but philosophy are a little bit different. They all confusion, confusions, but Han Yu is start to against the Taoism, uh, religious Taoism and uh, Buddhism. But the Liao basics accept uh, Buddhism, okay? Uh, so he kind of combined Buddhism and uh, Confucianism together. And the Liu Zhongyuan kind of like combine Buddhism, Taoism, and the Confucianism together. And the one thing different between Liu Zhongyuan and the Han Yu, Han Yu still have the kind of like a respect for consider heaven and the human interaction. And the Liu Zhongyuan kind of total different way. He think human is doing human thing. If you have a disaster, that's our fault. Nothing to do with heaven. So they have the slightly different in this way, but in general, we can call uh, all of them Confucianism. So as their movement, they have the thing happen is, uh, I need to uh, have a brief introduction, is so-called the Hui Chang persecution of Buddhism. So it happened on the year of 841. Uh, the persecution of the Buddhism is compared to the Western uh, Great Inquisition, uh, the uh, Christian church did is just very, very small, okay? Uh, because, it, because it only happened uh, three times in China. In general, Chinese um, treat religious more uh, freely than uh, Europe. So just quickly talk about the reason uh, why have the persecution. Basic is follow 
what Han Yu is arguing. So first, economic reason, because of the war and they have a war against the Wei World tribe and they cause a lot of almost bankrupt the country. So the emperor Wu Zhong, okay, have uh, confiscate the Buddhism, a uh, Buddhist monastery, okay, to because a lot of uh, believer will donate gold, you know, to make the gold uh, statue of Buddha. So they have to confess this one. That's for the uh, economic reason. Second reason for the social reason because Buddhism focus um, because the Buddhist monk doesn't have to. Uh, do the service and they don't pay tax. So the Buddhists undermine the social structure of Taiwan, uh, no, sorry, China. <laughs> they claim they wrote the loyalty, the son to father and the subject to the ruler and encouraging people to leave their own family and they become monk and monk. That's basically Han Yu's argument. And another religious reason, that's Wu Zhong, the emperor, his personal reason, because he believed he is a strong Taoist, Taoist religious believer. So he believes Taoism should make people live, pursue immortality. And uh, Buddhism encourages people to go to Nirvana, which is equal to death, no birth. So he, when he worry about his own death, he doesn't like Buddhism. That's his personal reason. And unfortunately, uh, Wu Zhong on only lived to, I think, 31 years old. He died very young, uh, probably by the uh, elixir because he practiced Taoism uh, immortality, take a lot of strange chemicals to extend his life. So turn out kill himself. And after he died, uh, the persecution stopped. So only short period of time. So, but uh, Han Yu has uh, influenced to the Buddhism is not make a den on um, uh, Buddhism religion, but his influence on writing is long living. Okay, and uh, and his uh, influence on philosophy also take a uh, has a strong influence on that. So basically, I finished the first part of that, and I will stop for a few minutes. If you have a comment or you have a question, and that's good. before we move on to the second part which is uh, we talk about how as a person, yeah. No comment? Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe a small comment. Yeah, please. Uh, when you were speaking of the prose by Han Yu of Confucian scholar of the and then they would write proclamation between a war against an enemy. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, I, I would like to make a, a rapprochement. I would like to make a rapprochement with what is happening today. Uh, when the US is uh, well, I, to invade the country, for example, the, the, West, the, the Western media would uh, make. Uh, uh, what I would to condition the minds of the people that the, the country that would be attacked is evil or the regime that has to be brought down. It's it's look a little a little bit the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the reason I want to I think it's uh, always the same. But the, I I like to focus is the writing. You know, even this kind of writing, <laughs> they have to write this way. It show you how yeah rigid. But, uh, but Jason, some texts by the Rand Corporation are masterpieces of geopolitics. You should read them. <laughs> okay, so um, let's move on to uh, Han Yu. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, this person, Han Yu. All right, so let me see what would be my note. So Han Yu was a, a precursor of Neo-Confucianism as well as the atheist and the poets. Okay, put this way. Even he doesn't know he's doing the Neo-Confucianism. That's the later name. Okay. Uh, people call it the Dao Xue. Okay, that we will talk about next week. Because during this time, he just want to change the writing style. He just want to 
change the mainstream uh, philosophy. 792, okay, he uh, failed four times on the uh, imperial, imperial exam, exam. So he not less uh, easy to get up his position. And then um, he tried to not only reform, he also want to reform the uh, Chinese government. And then he reject the traditional prose writing, so-called the Pianwen, which has introduced and that becomes so which is become so burdened and uh, restrictive rule and almost impossible in the writing. And uh, the resulting literary freedom gives rise to a new genre of prose of romance. So you will see after him, the writing become more interesting. Okay, we will introduce some of them. You will see it's not possible uh, in using the Pianwen to write and the Chinese writing become much open. So I will consider this movement, you know, it's a great movement and, and, and the next great movement will be, wait, we have to wait until uh, 20th century, okay, the so-called the, the language reform by Hu Shi, the vernacular Chinese movement. So people start to write like today we are writing. So uh, you will see this kind of movement is important to open up a culture. But of course, always have some conservative uh, people will think about, well, that cut off uh, the culture from the past. But, you know, uh, personally, I will appreciate this kind of movement because you will open up up for the new uh, uh, future. Okay. So Han Yi also uh, uh, advocated the central, centralized government and want to return back to Confucian's idea. And uh, he deployed Taoism and the Buddhism as a teaching which encourages self-centeredness and the dis, uh, disregard others. That's his view. And uh, criticized the Buddhism monk and the Taoist priest become they do not work, do not produce, and the worst war, they teach people do not work. So that's his complaint about the social work. So Han Yu believes Buddhism and the Taoism were causing the Chinese to think they did not need to worry about their treatment of others in this world. Okay, because they are too, more, too much uh, focused on the, uh, the other world. So Han Yu like to quote, from Mencius and uh, Da Xue, the great learning. I think it's the beginning of this year. I have introduced on this one, and uh, the, I will find a chance to introduce another one, the doctrine of the being and the Yi Jing, uh, which will consider important. So, uh, so his writing has laid the foundation for the later new Confucianist and uh, for the, the new uh, development. So he attempted his new position in the company. So he got the influence, let me see. So, so okay, so I think the, some of uh, some his famous writing, we will introduce study of the way, so-called Yuan Dao, on man, on spirit, okay. So that's his famous writing. And uh, the basics that I would like to call him as uh, this kind of movement, like a Chinese uh, Renaissance movement. So if I make it uh, simple, you know, you can see his writing, his support the centralized government. He is against uh, individualism. And uh, so this side seems like he's more on the control side, but in the writing, he supports liberation in writing. So it's open up in the philosophical, uh, philosophical side, philosophical, philosophical writing. That's what he is uh, going to do. So one thing is about his uh, uh, literary reform. Okay, Han Yi boldly advocated to use the Zhou philosophers and early Han writer as a model for the proofs and the writing. If you recall, a few slides ago, we talked about the Pianwen. Okay, so this is such a rigid uh, writing, and he, I would say, he's. Uh, movement is strong. And that's also, we can see why he failed four times in his imperial exam. Because during that time, people probably not appreciate his writing style. 
Okay, if you think about most of people writing in this kind of rigid form, and people will see his writing is unacceptable. So this reform brought about the liberation in writing. The sentence units in prose writing was now free to seek its own lens and the structural pattern and according to logic and the content, rather than slavish conforming to the rule of Pian Wen, okay? With this new literary freedom, Liu Zhongyuan, Han Yu, uh, the chief of the, was able to write charming travel and uh, landscape piece, and he write a lot of fables. And the new uh, journal of prose writing soon developed, tales of love, romance, heroic feast, and adventures, and the many mysterious and supernatural and of imaginary incidents and the fictionized history. This prose romances in classical prose style were written for entertainment and the literary and did not reach the mass until much later. Which is so, so we last time we introduced, the, so this kind of writing then, you know, the writing start to become have his in entertainment purpose. Okay, because most of people start to understand uh, what's the uh, writing. So this situation doesn't happen during the Tang Dynasty, but after the Song Dynasty, the people, uh, more people can read, and the Ming Dynasty, which we introduce the novel, you know, become the popular. Most of people, well, I should not say most of people, but the people, regular people, as long as you are literate, you can. Uh, uh, read the novel. Okay. So that's his great achievement. So some of his writing, he write a lot and the, I didn't read uh, most of them, but some important I'd like to uh, list here. Okay, important is the one is so-called on the origin of Dao, Yuan Dao, that's the most famous. And another one is talking about teaching, uh, teaching, okay, and then uh, explanation of study. And this one is a proclamation to the crocodile. You can see he, after you change the writing style, let's open up another way to write. So he write the proclamation to the crocodile. Basically he is just accused the crocodile did something wrong if people, you know, and he tried to teach the crocodile. And uh, then he just warned the crocodile, I'm going to expel you to the other land. If you didn't listen, I will kill you. So it's a, so why he write this, okay? He is writing to imply, I think that's my, my taking, okay? Uh, I think he is writing his uh, philosophical idea of the uh, Confucian government, okay? So it's famous uh, in the uh, Chinese government, traditional Chinese government is not pure Confucian, Confucian, right? It's a, a outside Confucian, inside legalism, okay? So basics, that's the style he's treating the crocodile. So the crocodile actually is not real crocodile, it's talking about the, uh, the corrupt officers, officials. So he kind of used Confucius way, okay, I will, teach you, I will warn you, and then if you are not teaching, not listen, I'm going to expel you or kill you, become very legalist. So that's his way, his idea of a government, and even we call it the Confucian government, but actually it's only outside the Confucian, but inside legalism. And this one is interesting, talking about a horse, and he talked about, uh, there's a concept called Bo Le. Okay, that's a famous person who can judge it's a good horse or bad horse. So in this one, he's talking about uh, people complain there's no good horse. No, he said, no, no, no. Because you don't find the person who can judge horse. Okay, if you find the person, right person, who can judge horse, then you will have a good horse. So here he is implying the government system, right? So you don't complain, oh, I don't have a, I don't have a good general to fight the war. I don't have a good uh, office, officials to take care of this, this, okay? No, because you don't know people. You don't judge, have a good judgment of people. 
Only thing you have to do, bring the right people in. So that's his philosophy, okay? Talking about the political, okay? And then he talked about the memorial on the bones of Buddha. So every certain years, uh, the emperor, because during the, that time, the mainstream thinking is Buddhism. So they have a big ceremonial uh, event to open or to show the Buddha. I talked about Guantama Buddha, okay? The bone, I think that's pinky bone. Uh, he just uh, has a memorial, submit the memorial to the emperor against this kind of event. That's his main uh, argument against the Buddhism. And he talked about a lot, of, just like we talked about before, the Buddhism is, uh, we already have a Confucianism, you know, we have many things, we should not go through Buddhism. That's, and they almost put him in, in trouble and he got exiled after this. So his achievement and we will go is later, I think, uh, uh, 803, 300, 300 years later, 350 years later, they built a memorial temple of Han Yu okay, in uh, Guangdong, in today's Guangdong, Chaozhou. <coughs> Another famous uh, writer, <coughs> Su Shi, okay, uh, he wrote this one fa very famous uh, commentary about the Han Yu. He talked about his prose reversed the literacy, literary decline of Eighth Dynasty. He talked about the Wei, Jin, and the Four Dynasty, and then Sui and the Tang. Okay, the Eighth Dynasty, the literary decline, and his teaching aided the misguided thought uh, throughout the world. Talk about misguided okay thought. Talk about people mainstream thinking I go away from the Confucian thinking. His loyalty led him to risk the rest of his master. He got expelled, okay, because his uh, memorial uh, to the bone of the, Bud the Buddha. And his courage suppressed the general of three armies. So the uh, commentary about him is his courageous person even suppressed the general of the armies. So that's Su Si's commentary about Han Yu. So that's the brief introduction of uh, Han Yu. And then uh, the next part, before we are going to the core part of uh, today, we are going to talk about the Neo-Confucianism, which has not been very clear during this time, and even not very clear during next week, because next week we talk about cosmology. Okay, And the cosmology basically is just the foundation. You have to wait until the data, the Song Dynasty, we shall have waited another 400 years, and then we will see clear picture of the Neo-Confucianism. Uh, we have a hands up on the, uh, Chris, please. Yeah, no, Jason, that was really good. That, that covered it all. I, I saw the only thing I will probably just add is that he, he was a really, he was really big on logic, right? Uh, and, and productivity. So in that sense, even though he is writing about Confucianism, in the Western um, you know, parlance, we can actually say he was a political scientist, right? Because his audience is the emperor and the governors. So he's really saying that, hey, you do realize that these Buddhists and Taoists, you know, like they make people so lazy and self-centered and they're completely non-productive. They're both, you know, economically and politically non-productive. They're just a bunch of lazy sacks, right? And it's, it's, it's really useless. So he, he was very like utilitarian that way. And he says, you really should come back to Confucianism, which, is, which will serve you much better as a government uh, doctrine and policy. So he was, really, he was really advising political policy more than like just ethical and moral behavior. Um, and his proposals are very logical. He was just saying, hey, you know, like, and forget about whether you believe the afterlife and coming out of the wheel or not. But my philosophy uh, with Confucianism is going to be just much better for you, you know, in, in the earthly realm, right? So, uh, so I think that was really good. So he was very, very focused on logic. And then he does make a distinction uh, between Taoism and Buddhism, though, where he just, he really just dismisses Buddhism as a barbaric religion because it's invented somewhere else, right? And he would just say, well, 
I mean, like, would you would you like bow to uh, you know a a bear? Or a tiger, you know, like you know, like you know, we're human beings, we're civilized human beings. This religion came out of, it came from somewhere else, you know. We we should not respect. So he 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 was pretty dismissive. Where was Taoism? He's more gentle. He would just say, well, these people are a bit confused between assigning importance to your current life versus your afterlife, right, uh, and your spiritual life. So you really should be more focused on your your practical current life. So as yeah, anyway, but the overall is really good. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chris. Yeah, I think you mentioned that I I, I carefully read the uh, Yuan Dao, the uh, uh, the originality of Dao. You know, uh, I I like this writing, and not because I I I agree with him, but I find out interesting. Like first thing you talk about, he's a political scientist or political uh, philosopher. That's true because most of Chinese philosophers are uh, political uh, 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 philosopher. And you talk about he is a utilitarian, and I, uh, I also agree because uh, because most of the time the people argue is based on the benefit, what's good, right? So we can call him a utilitarian. And about logic, that's the part I'm very interested about. Han Yu's writing, he's against the law, the, the the Buddhism. He kind of just like you said. It's a barbarian religion. Why you bow to this foreigner? We have our own sage. Now, why you do this from the no, no, no culture Indian? You know, this kind of thing. But carefully read his writing, he used the logics a lot, which was introduced by Buddhism. So uh, I think that's very interesting. And then uh, I find out the, 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 the writer, okay, after this time, they got more more clear, okay? Their thinking is more clear, okay? So their logic become much clear. They have the reason they talk about, I think that's all benefit from the Buddhism. Even you reject <laughs> Buddhism teaching, but you have to use Buddhism logic to uh, reject uh, their teaching. And that's, I find out it's quite uh, interesting. Yeah. So, okay, so let's move to the third part. And we will talk about the uh, Neo-Confucianism. Okay, so uh, I think this part is important if you, because we can say for the last hour, we only set up the background of the um, historical background. And then we talk about the person, you yeah. know, before I was thinking about, we probably bring all the philosophers uh, together, but I think that's probably too messy. And Han Yu probably is good enough to represent uh, this kind of thinking because we still don't see the uh, result until four, 400 years later, we will see the Zhu Xi have the movement, which will change a lot. So uh, I'm going to read from the uh, writing of Feng Yulan and I copy from here. I think that it's pretty good, okay? His writing is this. This one is from uh, Feng Yulan, uh, the, short, uh, the short history of the Chinese philosophy. He said Confucianism had that by this time, that means the 8th century, already lost the vitality which it had once uh, manifested in the form of such men as Mencius, Xunzi, and Dong Zhongshu, that's in mean, Han Dynasty. The original texts were there, and their commentary and the sub-commentary were even more numerous than before. Yet they failed to meet the spiritual interest, the need of the age. After the, uh, the revival of Taoism, and the introduction of Buddhism, people had become more interested in the metaphysical problem and in which I call super moral value, or as they were then phrased, the problem of the nature and the destiny. Okay, I think this part is important because in traditional Confucianism, if you are in a group, we read uh, analytics, right? Confucius constantly focus on the today's situation. And when he even ask people not just respect the spirit, okay? Don't doing too much work on that. So Confucius is focused on this world. But after the Neo-Taoism and which become similar to the 
uh, Taoism, uh, Taoist religion and the institutes of the Buddhism, people start to figure out something we are missing, right? The metaphysical part is not in Confucius, okay? So, and the uh, formula I call it the super moral value, okay? I think the proper word in today, we probably want to call it the meta ethics, right? Or the metaphysical foundation of the morality, all right? So, and then uh, in the Chinese term, they firm it called the, uh, in Chinese word called xing ming zi xue, okay? Xi means the nature, which means the uh, nature of the human, human nature, okay? So talk about the uh, nature and the destiny. So basically after the introduction, uh, after the Buddhism, uh, and the Taoism religion, right? People not only, so if you start to feel like the Confucian teaching is not enough. So what's my nature, human nature? What's a human destiny? That's the part, okay? Confucians never teach. So we take this part of that. So this kind of uh, uh, problem, you know, even you reject, Taoism, you reject Buddhism, but this problem you still need to resolve. Metaphysic problem and meta meta ethic problem you need to resolve. So we have seen in before we talk about uh, the and so they start to talk about this kind of problem are not decade in Confucius' work in Anadek, uh, mentions and the doctrine of mean. Okay. Uh, Confucius talk about it, but we never focus much on that. But Mencius talk about human nature and Dr. Rosmin deal more on the human psychology. This kind of thing start to work and the metaphysics, which will go back to the book of change. So this need a generally new interpretation in, in, and the elucidation in order to meet the problem of the new age. And this type of interpretation was as yet taken despite the effort of the emperor's scholar. So that's Feng Yulan's writing about the starting of the Neo-Confucius, uh, Confucianism, because they have the problem they want to resolve. So this one is talking about the, also from the uh, uh, Feng Yulan's writing, Basics he talked about, I think that's also important. There are three lines of thought that can be traced as a main source of Neo-Confucianism. The first, of course, is the so-called uh, Confucianism itself. And the second is the Buddhism and, and Zen Buddhism. I think the Feng Yulan use different spelling. So if you prefer the Zen Buddhism, uh, for all the school of Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, most influential, the Neo Confucian he's talking about. And the, the third one is the Taoist religion, of which the cosmological view of the Yin Yang school and become the important part. And the, the cosmology of the Neo Confucian is, is chiefly connected with the, this line of thought, which means Taoist religion. So that's the part the next week. Uh, we are going to talk about, but it doesn't happen during this time. It happened in uh, uh, 300 years later in the Song Dynasty. <laughs> so these three lines of thought were heterogeneous and even in many respects contradictory. Okay, so we talk about three things, right? Confucian, Confucianism, Taoist religion, and the Buddhism. It's they are totally different and a lot of places they are contradictory. So here come with a very special way of a Chinese synthesizing skill. Okay, basics will have three things, try to merge, synthesize together. I think that's a very different. I think at the beginning someone asked what's the difference between Chinese philosophy and Western philosophy. The contents are different, but the way to deal uh, different concepts is also different. 
That's the way Chinese did. If you pay attention, it took time for philosopher to make a unity out of that. These three experiences, the unity are not simply eclecticism, right? It's not eclecticism. You just sometimes I use this one, sometimes I use that, or take the middle. Term. But it's a general system for mean a homogeneous whole. So that's why I introduced um, uh, the journey to the West last two weeks ago. Because in the journey of West, you will see the, the, the bureaucratic system, okay, that's, and the Chinese worldview, actually it's a combination, a synthesized concept of Confucianism, Buddhism, and uh, Taoist religion. And it's not just the so-called eclecticism, it's a homogeneous as a whole. So the whole beginning of the neo confusion may be traced back to Han Yu and the Liao, okay? And the system also did not become clear formed until 11th century, which we will introduce probably two weeks from now. Next week, we talk about metaphysics. This was the time when Song Dynasty and uh, uh, which reunited China after the period of confusion following by the collapse of Tang and the height of the splendor and the prosperity. Okay, so, uh, so here uh, Fong Yulai is talking about the neo-Confucianists were chiefly interested in cosmology. So uh, from here, if we make it simple, is uh, this scholar, they fight against Buddhism and against Taoism religion, but they realize there's something they need to build. And since you reject the foreign uh, teaching, say so you got to find something in your own old teaching, which they find out in the mentions and uh, doc uh, doctrine of the mean. But most important, they are in the Yi Jing, the book of change. So next week, we were going to talk about the uh, cosmologist, which is totally reinterpretation of Yi Jing, okay, and which will bring to become the foundation of the neo Confucianism. So that's the uh, part. And to this point, since we have a new term called Neo Confucianism, and then we call it Dao Xue. And if you remember uh, a few months ago, when we talk about the uh, Neo Taoism, we use a name called Xuan Xue, right? And which is in happened on the second and the third century. And this term has been uh, formed on the fifth century. So basics is Xuan Xue, basically they focus on three books. It's Yi Jing, Book of Change, and the Dao De Jing, the Lao Zi, and the Zhuang Zi, these three books. So uh, this one I totally talk about the uh, metaphysics. And then this guy lead to more individual individualism and more on the thought of the free spirit thought thinking. So this one will be thrown away and being replaced with the new thinking about the uh, Confucianism, uh, neo-Confucianism. So I hope I will make it clear, but you know, uh, I think that going forward, we will make it uh, uh, focus on this part. And there's another important part is the so-called uh, transmission of the truth. Okay, it's a little bit, um, complex, but I, I would like to uh, bring up here. Is this, it's also from Feng Yulan's writing. I find out it's interesting. He talk about the theory of the transmission of the truth from Yao Sun, that's the ancient sage downward through, is already suggested by Mencius, okay? And was evidently inspired by Han Yu and the Yao, and by the Zen theory and historical teaching, uh, of the Buddha has been transmitted uh, through a line of patriarchs to the Hongren and uh, Huinan. Okay, if you are um, <clears throat> familiar with the Zen Buddhism tradition, right? Here I talk about the 28th uh, Bodhidharma, 
okay, come to uh, China and then he has to transmit his teaching to the second uh, uh, patriarch, uh, Hui Ke, and then who Sheng Chan, Dao Xin, uh, Hong Ren, uh, Hui Neng, okay, Lai by Lai translation. So uh, Han Yu and uh, Liao is try to set up this line of the Confucius uh, tradition through the history. And, and according to Feng Yulan, it's really inspired okay, uh, by the Zen Buddhism theory. So, uh, so any, I will pause for a few uh, minutes before I go to the history. Yeah. So that's uh, the concept of uh, near uh, Confucianism and we call it Daoxue in, in another way. Any comment? Okay. So let's move on for um, this one. Uh, I hope it's not too messy, but uh, I think that's the best I can do. So before, because if you are not familiar with these people, it will be difficult to read the text from uh, Mencius or from uh, Han Yu's writing, okay, because they have to call a lot of names. So I have to make it uh, a chart like this. So go through the history, okay, 220 BC, okay, that the three sage king, okay, Emperor Yao and Sun and uh, Yu, okay, so when Yao died, he abdicated the throne to Sun, and the Sun abdicated the throne to Yu. Okay, so that's how, how they train. So that's considered a sage, sage king. And when Yu became an emperor, he started the dynasty of Xia. Okay, so that's around 220 BC, okay, very long time ago. And then about five, six hundred later, okay, they have the emperor of Tang, okay, remember it's not Tang dynasty, it's Tang, okay, of the Song dynasty, okay, he has a revolution, he set up, okay, so he also considered as a stage king. And another 500 years passed, okay, and then that's a famous, uh, the emperor, the emperor Wen of Zhou, okay, and the Emperor Wu of Zhou, who is his son, okay? And his brother, Duke Zhou, okay? Okay, so these three people, father and the two sons, they have a revolution, set up the Zhou dynasty, and the Duke Zhou, this guy, he become the prime minister, and he set up all the rituals. Confucius has been praised, the best of the best. He keep, he want everything go back to, this period of time. So 500 years, okay, we know we have a Confucius, okay, he's teaching. And 100 years later, they have the Mencius, okay. So during the same similar time, they have the Xunzi, and in the first century, they have the Yang Xiong, okay. So just to remind everyone, just make it quick, Mencius talk about human nature is good, Xunzi is talk about human nature is bad. So we need the education, and later on, his disciple, his student, become the uh, legalism. Okay, and the Yang Xiong is the philosopher who kind of try to revolutionize the uh, Yi Jing. Okay, so Yi Jing have Yin and the Yang, and uh, he make a different kind of Yi Xing Jing called Tai Xuan. Okay, so all this uh, that's the historical background. Okay, so uh, I just want to make sure you know we are not too foreign about uh, this name. Uh, Joe, please. Yeah, it was Han Fei then um, the student of Zun, Zun Xi? Yes, Han okay. Fei and uh, the Si are student of Xun, uh, Xun Zi. Okay, Xun so Xun, I, put, yeah, I, put a, I put a X sign here, okay, because they've been uh, declared as a heresy. <laughs> okay, because so the uh, Orthodox lies going to go through here to Confucius to Mencius, okay? But no more, Xunzi, Yang Xiong, no, no, okay, they are heresy. So in my opinion, 
this kind of movement, neo Confucius movement, in a sense, they make Confucianism become a religious like okay, philosophy. Okay. So even they don't have a God to worship, but their practice is, for example, set up the orthodoxy, okay, and the standard is very religious like. Okay. So by knowing these people, we can read the mentions which uh, the uh, Fongyuan's writing mentioned, um, but uh, he didn't quote. Okay, but it's long. But uh, let me see. So I hope it makes sense from now. Okay, Mencius said. Okay, that's in his Mencius writing. From Yao and the Sun down to Tang were five hundred years and more. So Yu and the Yao. Gao Yao, Gao Yao is the minister of the uh, minister of law of Yu. Okay, they saw these early sages and uh, so knew their doctrine. While while Tang Tang heard this doctrine as uh, transmitted and uh, so knew them. And from Tang to Emperor Wen of Zhou were five hundred years and uh, and more. As Yi Yin is and uh, Lai uh, Lai Zhu. Okay, they are the minister of the. Tang of Sang, they saw Tang and they knew the doctrine. And while Emperor Wen of Zhou heard uh, them as uh, transmitted, and uh, so known, so knew them. So remember the word, heard them as transmitted, so knew them. From Emperor Wen and Zhou to Confucius were 500 years and more. So as Tai Gong Wang, uh, Wang Tai, tai Gong Wang and uh, 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 what's his name? Tai Gong, Tai Gong Wan, the San Yi Sheng, they are the chief minister of Zhou. They saw the emperor Wen of Zhou, and so they knew the doctrine. While Confucius heard them as transmitted, so knew them from Confucius downward until now. So basics, the mention is talking about every five hundred years. Okay, they have the sage come out. Okay, so when they heard the doctrine and as transmitted, and they knew that. Okay. So they all consider, they never think about that's my invention, that's great. No, no. Mencius is talking about from Yao Sun, okay? And 500 either, okay, they have the Tang, okay? And 500 years after, they have the Zhou, okay? Wen, Wu, and the, uh, uh, Duke Zhou. And 500 years later, they have the Confucius. They all uh, heard, the teaching, the doctrine as transmitted, they knew it. So they start to bring up. So that's the sage tradition. Okay, that's the financial writing. And this kind of writing has been ignored for a few hundred years. So that's Han Yu's writing. Um, he's uh, so called very famous called Yuan Dao. Okay, sometimes we translate as on the origin of nature of the truth, which is Dao. So you, uh, you can pay, start to pay some attention on his logic, okay? It's become more westernized logic. So what I call the Tao is not what has here been called the Tao by Taoists and the Buddhists. Because everybody, in Chinese, everybody talk about Tao. Yao, the sage king, transmitted the, the Tao to Sun, okay? That's another sage king, his. And the Sun transmitted to Yu, okay? And Yu transmitted to Kin Wen, even they don't see each other, they don't know each other, they have 500 years apart, they still can transmit it, okay, to Kin Wen and Wu and the Duke Zhou. And when Wen and the Zhou and Wen and the Wu and the Duke Zhou transmitted to Confucius, remember, Confucius is 500 years later, okay, but they still can transmit it. So Confucius transmitted this to Mencius, okay. Mencius is over hundred years after Confucius. He never met Confucius, but Confucius still transmitted to Mencius. After Mencius, he was no longer transmitted. Okay, Xunzi and Yang Xiong select from there, but without reaching the essential portion. They discuss it, but without sufficient clarity. So he declared. Yang Xiong and the Mencius, I believe, uh, 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 and the Xunzi, I believe their teaching probably sort of popular during that time. That's why they, he declared they are uh, heresy, 
in, in another sense. So then he talked about the teaching, the moral teaching of the Confucianism. Okay. He talked about universal love is called benevolence, which is the Ren, and the behavior which are consistent with benevolence are called righteousness. Okay, so this one is something new in the writing. He start to make a clear definition, right? Okay, so he talked about moving forward from benevolence and the righteousness we call Tao, something which you have and do not rely on outer environment is called the, which is virtue. Benevolence and the righteousness are the non, which have definite meaning, while Tao and the virtue are non, which do not have a definite meaning. Therefore, Tao has Jinzi's Tao and the small people's Tao, and the virtue has good virtue and the evil virtue. So here he kind of reverse the uh, importance between uh, benevolence, uh, benevolence and uh, righteousness versus Tao and uh, virtue. So in Taoism teaching, we we'll put, if you read the Tao Te Ching, we usually, uh, Lao Tzu always put the Tao and the virtue as the highest position and look down on the benevolence and the righteousness. And Han Yu is make a clear definition and they said, uh, benevolence and the righteousness is in the high. Okay, they have the, that's the goal we are doing. And the Tao and the virtue is the way to reach this one. So when you reach this one, they have the Junzi Tao and the small people's Tao. When you talk about virtue, they have a good virtue, they have a bad virtue. So it kind of the reverse the, uh, uh, the, 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 the benevolence uh, uh, and the Tao, okay? So the important become different. So he started to criticize Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu despised benevolence and the righteousness, not because he vilified the benevolence and the righteousness, but for he has a narrow-minded, okay? He started to criticize Lao Tzu, the Taoism sage, a narrow-minded. It is like someone who watched the heaven from under the whale. He said the heaven is very small, but actually it is not. Lao Tzu takes small favor as benevolence and the timid and the worry as righteousness. So it is nature that he looked down on benevolence and the righteousness. The Tao, which Lao Tzu referred to, is his concept of Tao and not the Tao I am talking about. The virtue which Lao Tzu referred to is his concept of virtue and not the virtue I'm talking about. All the virtues I have referred to are set in integrating benevolence and uh, righteousness, and uh, they are vertical of the people. The virtues which Lao Tzu has referred to are set without the benevolence and the righteousness, and uh, they are only his personal opinion. So basically here, he is used the so-called new logic to criticize Lao Tzu. Okay, he said you, just narrow-minded, okay? You make the wrong definition. So, because you are looking at it small, that's why you see the uh, benevolence and the righteousness are small, actually, because you are following the small Tao and the, the uh, small virtue. So that's his arguments again on this one. So, uh, I shall find some time to get more detail on this Yuan Dao because it's really worth to uh, read. And then I just, today's purpose, I just give a flavor, you know, how Han Yu's movement of uh, Neo Confucianism. And then um, <clears throat> a few weeks later, when we, next week, we will talk about metaphysics. And after that, you will see, start to see the influence coming through. Yeah. And then if you compare to the original index, you will find, oh, probably very different one uh, uh, when, when, when what Confucius original teach. Yeah. So I will stop for a few minutes before I move on for the last part and I'm going to bring up a uh, different philosophy and kind of compare to what Han Yu is talking here. So I hope uh, it's, it's clear. So if you have a question or comment, yeah.
Okay, so let me quickly make sure we got to the uh, the Yao, and there's a two more people I'd like to introduce. Okay, so I think I already talked about the Yao. Okay, so remember during this time, all the philosopher you must be in high government position. Okay, which you will see different in the Song Dynasty. Okay, in the Song Dynasty you can have no job, no real job, and you can be famous. But during this time and before, uh, all the philosophers, okay, people introduced, okay, you got to be in high government position. Okay. So otherwise, uh, we don't know because, you know. So, the, uh, so uh, basically his difference is he kind of, not like uh, uh, Han Yu totally reject Buddhism. He kind of tried to integrate many Buddhist ideas into Confucians and begin the development of metaphysical framework to justify Confucian ethical thinking. And then he start to focus on the question of human nature and the human destiny, which had not been mentioned in uh, Confucians. So, so he, this philosopher, including Han Yu and the Yao and the Zongyuan, Liu Zongyuan, they start to uh, called Da Xue, the great learning, uh, Zhong Yong, the doctrine of the Nin, and Yi Jing, okay, the classic, uh, the book of change to help build um, this one. And you will see that uh, very clear the next week, we will totally talk about the uh, metaphysics, which is all based on Yi Jing. Uh, Joe, please. Actually, now then you just basically covered what I was about to say with the idea. I just want to ask how did the development of metaphysics like essentially impact like what would be an example of the metaphysics impacting Confucian's ethics? Like uh, if you could provide an example of that, but we could go over that next week when we get into the metaphysics. We will do that. And I think that's a big question, you know. It is a very big question. Yes, a very big I, question. How does metaphysics impact? I, I think one thing I, uh, I, I plan to talk about this uh, to save for next week, but we can mention it is Thomas Aquinas, okay? I find out that this kind of thing is very similar to since this kind of sensorizing, okay? Yeah. Oh, very similar to Thomas Aquinas, okay? So when during that time, 13th century in the Europe, most of Christian has been dominated by Platonic, okay? Uh, yeah, Christian. and it moved to the Aristotle. Yeah, this yeah, is exactly and, where I was going, yeah. Discover the syllogism, okay? How are we going to put this one together? Because of the syllogism itself has make sense. Then you want to put together. So same situation as this one in Chinese development. They see the religious, the Taoism religious, and they see the Buddhism. They, they open different mind, which, you know, it's convincing. Or it makes sense by itself, but it's different than Confucius teach. And the, they got to develop something. And then they go to the, uh, Yi Jing, okay, to develop the cosmologies, okay, they, the book called the cosmologies, but I think personally more proper name, probably metaphysics, but again, you may argue, you should not call it metaphysics, because there's no existence of God, there's no immortality of soul, there's no human free will, uh, okay, but yeah, okay, so whatever, okay, so that's it, that's one thing, and we will talk about this one, and another thing important, that's my personal view. I kind of doubted whether or not Confucius really focus on Book of Change, the Yi Jing or not. Okay. I know most of people will say, oh, Confucius uh, like this one do that. But I kind of doubt it because I see probably being added during this period of time, because people start to think, uh, that one is important. So we put the Yi Jing in Confucius mouth on that. Well, again, I, I'm not going to argue on this one. I know that a lot of people may disagree on this one and the next week and the following week we can discuss on this one. So- uh, uh, Jason, Jason, may I- Yeah, please, please. I know you probably disagree. <laughs> no, 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 it's not about the teaching. Okay. Uh, because, uh, but it's about metaphysics. Okay, please. Uh, because, 
in the section 2.8.6 of the Mencius, uh, Mencius were talking of the four natural seeds of, uh, of commiseration, of uh, discernment, of uh, rituals, and of respect, okay? Uh, I mean, when a philosopher states as a kind of thesis that in human, that in the core human nature, you are born with four seeds of maybe the words that I'm choo that I choose is a bit clumsy, but of uh, spiritual powers. Okay, because after all, respect, discernment, uh, and so on, and commiseration. Uh, those are spiritual powers that can be developed into something bigger. Don't you think that it's a kind of pronouncement of metaphysical pronouncement of, uh, uh, because it's, uh, it's a statement, okay? There is no proof of it, okay? And we know that when we talk about metaphysical considerations, it's about yeah. statement about uh, the ontology of reality. Yeah. And, yeah. And, here, and here we have a very clear distinction between the natural world and the spiritual world. And it's in the text that has been recognized as having been written uh, 23, 24 centuries ago, yeah. before some new Confucianism. Okay, that's another thing. I, that's my personal um, philosophy or a personal understanding. I don't think the measures has been that important before this time. Okay, so if you look at the uh, grand historian uh, by Sima uh, Qian, okay, measures may not be that important due, before okay. this time. Because before not, this time, before this time, what do you mean? Tang Dynasty or Song Dynasty? Tang Dynasty before the okay because the, before that the people they had the people hardly mentioned mentions. If you look at the uh, Sima Qian's the great uh, historian record, yeah. he put the Confucius in the whole set right, and he put a disciple of Confucius a uh, lot of it. But how much he write about mentions? He read was probably one paragraph, and then the three people okay they put together. So yes, so you can see probably. Not that important. And today we constantly call Mencius because of this movement. So of course, Mencius is more mystical, historical, okay, talking about heaven, superpower. Okay, he talk about how Lan Zi Qi, the all-inspiring Qi. Okay. Yeah. That other thing is not in Confucius. So uh again, that, that's my thinking. Okay, because I try to look at not from the uh, Neo Confucius point of view. I look at try to before Neo Confucius point of view. So that would be a little bit different. So uh, historically, historically, uh, the four books have do they, do they have been uh, have they been acknowledged during the Tang Dynasty as the corpus of classical? I think it's, uh, it's happened after this time. Okay, it doesn't recognize us these four books before this time because. Uh, you see, right now, all these philosophers, Liao, Han Yu, okay, they start to talking about the doctrine of mean, they talk about yeah. great learning, okay, and apparently they are not that important before this time, that's why they start to focus. And I kind of suspect Xun Zi and Yang Xiong probably popular, not really popular, but people talking about it. You know, and unlike today, people don't talk about Xunzi, people don't talk about Yang Xiong. But during that time, probably people talk about this. That's why, you know, the Han Yu will say, oh, uh, Xunzi, or oh, Yang Xiong, or oh, they only know part of that. You know, so that, that, that's the reason I have this kind of uh, statement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you for the question for Tajaji. I know a lot of people have a different opinion on this one, and I'm not saying I'm right, but basically that's the way I read uh, the ancient text. Okay. So uh, I think so right now, I think we talk about Liao, and I really, let me jump to Liu Zhongyuan, and I think Liu Zhongyuan is a great person, and then uh, 
uh, Fong Yulan didn't bring much on that. So he is different than Han Yu. Even both are Confucianism, okay, Confucians. So basically we can talk about him. He write a lot of points, favor, reflected term look. He's a good point and his service is successful. And the, uh, his effort to put the uh, decree of heaven and okay, so his big difference to Han Yu is he reject the heaven influence to people. He believe the any disaster is humans problem. Okay, so this one make him not so orthodox. Okay, in compared to others because in the uh, later Song scholar, they kind of were to, in a way to deal with heaven. And that's back to Joe's question, okay? Uh, why they have to do metaphysics of cosmology? When they talk about cosmology, they are not talking about the sun, the moon, the star. They are talking about Yijing, which is try to discover the underlying principle. So in this sense, they want to use the underlying principle to communicate to call heaven or the Tao of heaven. So that's the next week's subject. But basics, that's the kind of movement. And you will know this kind of movement is difficult because we face three different contradictory philosophies. And you don't want to take us uh, eclecticism, all right? Okay, you don't want just average it, or sometimes use this one, sometimes use. you want to become a homogeneous whole. So that's an effort, and the they take three hundred years. I think that's a good job for three hundred years, and they eventually come with a solution. So I will end today's uh, presentation on this point, and I think this point is represent, because uh, in the, another famous thing is Tang, so-called uh, the po poetry of Tang is very famous. And all people read, uh, have received Chinese education or been asked to memorize some of that. And this kind of literature movement make this poetry very simple, easy to understand. And I bring this one is written by Liu Zhongyuan. <clears throat> And as I remember when I was probably four or five years, my aunt, who was a Chinese, uh, high school Chinese teacher, she asked me to memorize this. And, uh, the, yeah. and I think I can understand for the four or five years old. I don't think I'm smart, but I think the, because the word is simple. Okay, so uh, basically talk of a reverse no. And I find that the translation from uh, Wikipedia is pretty good. So. Uh, just read it. A thousand mountains, no sign of birds in flight. Ten thousand paths, no trace of human tracks. In a long boat, an old man in rain hat and a straw raincoat, fishing along in the cold river snow. So it's very easy, you know, with this kind of simple, only 20 Chinese character. He described this kind of picture in the old uh, in the cold weather, no people, only an old fisherman and the fishing in the cold river. Okay, so this kind of seems, so that make uh, Chinese poetry, poet is very kind of like painting. Okay, you have this kind of painting, make everything a little bit different. And this one is written by Liu Zhongyuan, okay, the great philosopher and uh, literary. And Liu Zhongyuan also write a lot of paper. And I really, I really like it. For example, he write a biography of a hunchback. All right. He talk about a hunchback is very good in growing trees. And uh, he's ugly, but people welcome him. And why? Because he know how to grow trees. And people ask him how to grow trees. Uh, he talk about all oh, his tree has its nature. You have to water it. And uh, at the evening, don't put too much attention. Just go home and uh, do whatever you have to do. Okay, don't put it. And then he talk about a lot of time, you know, people laugh too much, put attention too much. So that kill the tree. So for the tree to grow well, you have to respect its nature. They go, go. 
And he continued to talk about education, right? Just like I think it's very uh, true for today's situation. A lot of helicopter parents, they put too much love, too much attention to their kids. And then he start, and then more, he talk about government, right? He kind of talk about government. He said, oh, some uh, magistrate, okay? They will say, go, go, okay, you have the water. Go, 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 you, that's the time to grow, okay? Go, 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 you don't forget to feed your chicken, okay? So this kind of thing, you bother the people because people know what to do. All you need to do is just let them do what they need to do. So they he write a simple story and which he talk about education and bring to the political philosophy. It's a beautiful writing, simple, everybody can understand and with a few lines. So I really think uh, Liu Zhongyuan is a great writer, philosopher, and in this sense, and he also write a good point. So uh, I will stop here today, and then uh, next week we will uh, talk about different subjects, which is related to this one. And then uh, let me put the uh, link on that if I have it. Okay. So uh, next week we talk about cosmology, uh, which will jump ahead 300 years in the Northern Song. And then uh, we will talk about the cosmology. And some people will be feel more interested in this one because a lot of people ask about I Ching. So next week, no moral teaching. Everything is about I Ching, Yin Yang, and uh, this kind of thing. And uh, then just like Joe asked, how does it relate it? Okay, well, I hope uh, I will get the an answer from here. So uh, let's give a few minutes to discuss if you have a question, comment, suggestion, complaint, you know. Yeah. No? So I hope, you know, uh, today's presentation makes sense. You know, it's not too, uh, dry and uh, they feel, I kind of feel like it's, it's difficult, only three, a few pages and uh, then I try to stop in so many things together and uh, then make my job a little bit difficult. And uh, then uh, I, I wish I talk about the journey to the West, which is more fun yeah, to talk about. Yeah. I wanna say thank you. I learned so much my first time, but I really learned a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. And then, by the way, if you go to the sign up sign and they have the, this, uh, they have the link, you can see the recording and the PowerPoint presentation will be there. But it's not, it takes me about one or two days uh, to, to post, but you know, it will be there. So if you want to have a further uh, uh, reading or something, and then welcome to send me the information and question if you want. And then, uh, Javier, please. I also want to thank you. It was very instructive and constructive. And I hope I get the person to join next week. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I hope you join. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, and thank uh, you very much, Jason. This yeah. was wonderful. I really appreciated it. Yeah, okay. So um, let's say I, I will uh, expect a little bit more discussion, but in the, since going to this period of time, it's a little bit difficult because uh, probably it's uh, uh, most of the people are not familiar with this kind of subject. So yeah, that's a little bit difficult. Yeah. Anyway, at least I do it. And I just have to say thank you everyone. And we only lost, let me see, five people from the beginning. So, <laughs> so that means, uh, and then uh, 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 because I know sometimes you have the 50 at the beginning and then only have 10 at the end. So anyway, so it's not too bad. So great. And thank you everyone. And I just have to say, personally, I enjoy uh, prepare this kind of material, it kind of organize my mind. And then when I talk this one, I start to realize something I'm not very sure. So, and sometimes people challenge me like, Quan, okay, sorry, you know, but I, 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 I really appreciate it because I don't want just uh, sitting in my cell, just like Han Yu talking about sitting in the whale watching the sky, okay, so, you know, I like to open up and have the people give me different opinion, yeah, 
I, I, I like learning from you, Jason. Thank you. You are welcome, and then hope you enjoy your weekend. And then Jason, personal you. question: Are you a, are you a historian? No, no, no. I'm nothing. I, <laughs> I, you, I'm an engineer, and then I, right now I have more time. And uh, personally, I like a philosophy, Western Chinese philosophy. And then uh, I think the one thing I uh, benefit a lot because I did a reading group uh, to read the Bertrand Russell's uh, Western philosophy, uh, with a history of Western philosophy. I think that helped me a lot, not because the learning the philosophy, because learning how to read between history and the philosophy. So I start to read the Chinese uh, philosophy in this way. And a lot of things, Chinese philosophy mm -hmm. start to make a lot of sense to me, yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, please join us uh, next week. See you, bye. Ciao.